Okay, good day everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, your patience this morning. Uh, as uh, you know, apologies for our slow start, uh, but we are here and we are going to commence uh, panel one for today's session. Uh, and this session really is focused on key findings from other election observation uh, teams, their findings and their recommendations that they're making. And it's a real privilege to have uh, Dr. Nicole Haley from the Australian National University join us uh, today. Uh, we have Jeremy Goro, the coordinator of the NRI Election Research and Observation Project uh, for the National Research Institute. And of course, Mr. Emmanuel Pock, Acting Registrar for the Integrity of Political Parties and Candidates uh, Commission. So each of our panelists today will be giving a presentation on their report, uh, their election observation that they carried out uh, during the 2022 national general elections. And that will be followed by a Q&A session uh, with TIPNG also joining that session to allow our participants online on Zoom and also here in person to ask questions uh, and make commentary uh, towards the end of, end of the session. And so it gives me great pleasure to introduce our first panelist, uh, Dr. Nicole Haley from the Australian National University. Thanks, Ariane. Okay, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thank you for to TIPNG for the opportunity to come and uh, present today. Um, we're not as advanced as TIPNG in terms of where we're at with our uh, observation report, although we will be, um, uh, we intend finalising our report in the, in the next few months. So what I'm presenting today is actually some preliminary sort of findings, some preliminary thoughts um, based on um, our assessment uh, of the most recent election. So just to, to preface with that. So, for starting, to start, um, at the invitation of the PNG Electoral Commissioner and with support from the Australian Aid Program, the ANU Department of Pacific Affairs undertook systematic observation of the PNG's most recent elections. To this end, we had staff in the field between June and early September of this year. The 2022 National General Election was the sixth consecutive PNG general election that I have observed and the fourth consecutive election um, during which uh, ANU has undertaken a large-scale observation. This observation, however, was the most comprehensive observation we've undertaken uh, to date. It involved, um, this time around, only 12 ANU personnel but 350 PNG-based citizen observers. So, specifically, just to give you a bit of an overview of what we did, we undertook observations in all four regions of the country. Each of our teams was led by a PNG academic or researcher, and all of the major tertiary institutions were represented in the ANU observation team. The team completed over 10,000 person days of observation during the election period. Um, we deployed 44 teams in total, and as I said, there was 362 uh, observers in, involved. And we undertook systematic observation over a two to three month period. So, our teams mobilised during the latter part of the campaign period. It had been our intention to start earlier around the issue of writs, um, but we didn't quite get there. But certainly our teams were, were in the field for probably the last four weeks or so of the campaign period, as well as through the, the polling uh, and into the counting period. Um, collectively, the team made detailed observations in 54 of the 118 electorates and surveyed over 12,000 citizens during 
um, during the campaign and post-polling period. So in addition to um, regular election observation activities, our teams undertake citizen surveys. One is undertaken during the campaign period and the second citizen survey takes place post-polling. And that's where we try to really to get at the heart of citizen experiences of the election, how they participated in the election, were they able to vote, were they able to vote freely, etc. Um, uh, so, as you might appreciate, with so many people in the field, so many days observation, citizen surveys, so we have quite a lot of both qualitative data, that's the observations that were made by our observers themselves, and quite a lot of quantitative data, which comes out of the citizen surveys. Um, that's why we're, our final report is still um, probably a couple of months away, um, realistically. Um, okay, so just sort of said that. Basically, the approach that we employ in relation to election observation has been designed in such a way to collect both qualitative and quantitative um, information or quanti qualitative and quantitative data in a systematic way that allows us to make comparisons across regions, across districts, across um, uh, provinces, etc. So, because we're asking exactly the same questions in the in the same places, and our observers are completing um, the same journal. So, our journal for this election, um, you know, was several hundred pages long. So, there's a lot of questions in there that the observers themselves answer and that's around things that they that they witness themselves that they heard themselves and and things like that so um, and and what the approach does is it allows us to examine um, and to make an evidence-based assessment um, on the extent to which PNG citizens own their own votes and exercise genuine choice in the election having regard to um, key international standards against which elections might be, be assessed. So, um, we can go to the next slide, yeah, okay. So just in terms of a general sort of overall assessment of the election, um, it's very much the case that elections in PNG are highly variable on multiple fronts. Indeed, election administration, electoral violence, insecurity, fraud and malpractice all vary significantly from location to location. But notwithstanding this variable nature of elections, we can say with a fair degree of certainty and confidence that the 2022 elections witnessed further deterioration in the overarching election environment, including in the preparation and execution of the election. Indeed, irregularities of various kinds um, were um, were identified by each of our, to a greater or lesser extent, by each of our observer teams. Um, we also found that the elections were um, qualitatively different to preceding elections um, and that the quality, integrity and credibility of the elections has further deteriorated. On the electoral administration front, and others have already talked about this today and noted it, the electoral role remains highly problematic and it disenfranchises eligible citizens across the country and is, and is given wide to many of the other irregularities that we've seen um, in the context of the election. Um, all 44 of our observer teams noted serious defects with the 2022 electoral roll. Notably, the updating of the roll did not commence until um, late 2021, early 2022, and the verification process provided for under law was dispensed with completely. Furthermore, the decentralisation of responsibility for the electoral roll preparation seems to have exacerbated previously identified problems, such as local capture, giving rise to more widespread fraud and malpractice. Teams also noted the extent to which the polling schedule, um, and again, the, the manner in which polling takes place around the country varies from 
um, province to province and district to district, not just in terms of whether there's one day polling or whether roving polling teams are, are used, utilised, but there's significant provincial variation often in terms of um, the number of enrolments at each um, uh, at each polling station. So in some in some places there's only like a single polling station per ward. Um, in other places, um, you have um, you know people in some parts of the country have much much greater opportunity to participate in the elections. Um, okay. I suppose related to that issue of um, franchise, I think the 2022 elections also saw the unequal relationships between different groups of citizens. And here I'm sort of thinking about men and women or urban settlers versus landowners. We saw those, um, I suppose, inequalities in terms of franchise further exacerbated. And this is something that really needs to be addressed moving forward. It's something that we've seen, particularly in urban areas over the course of the last few elections, but um, certainly much more marked in this election than, than previously. Um, I suppose w one of the things that I wanted to um, actually sort of focus on and comment upon today was um, a question that I've been asked over and over again over the course of this election, with lots of people saying, how does 2022 compare to previous elections? And many people who've asked me this question have simultaneously sort of commented and reflected upon the fact that the election seemed quieter, particularly in the Highlands region. And, you know, when people talk about quieter, they talk about, um, you know possibly less violent and possibly being better because it was quieter. Um, in the sort of remainder of the talk, I want to go through and, and sort of examine that a little bit based on some of the observations that, that we made in, in different places. Because I think what we saw in this election was, yes, it was quieter in some places, particularly in the, supper, in the, in the central and upper highlands region. Um, but quieter in many respects just meant that the election was very much controlled and that the, the opportunities for genuine political competition um, have been significantly reduced um, in the context of this election. And for me, that was, that's probably the most significant difference between this election and, and previous ones. So, just... Again, a little bit by way of background. Obviously, elections in PNG are um, hyper-competitive. They're fiercely contested and they typically attract large numbers of candidates. We saw in this election candidate numbers uh, increased further um, from 2017. Uh, so, we, you know, but with the addition of the, the extra seats, we saw the average number of candidates, I think, per seat, only increased from sort of 30 to 31. But uh, as the electoral commissioner showed in his presentation, you know, we have particular electorates where there were between 50 and, you know, 70 plus candidates contesting. Um, if we look at the results from, from 2017, um, we know that the majority of candidates received a primary vote share of less than 3%. So the majority of candidates are actually not securing very many votes at all. Um, unfortunately, I can't tell you what that was this time around because we haven't had access to the full data. Um, we haven't had access to the full information around voter enrolments and things. We saw in the Commissioner's presentation earlier this morning that there was 5.6 million people um, enrolled. In previous elections, this, the observation missions have had access to um, enrolment data, you know, at sort of province, district, you know, LLG and ward level. That wasn't made available to us this time and certainly the full results, the 66As, 66Bs, haven't been made available to us. So, 
if we had that information, we could start to do some of this um, evidence-based analysis that allows us to actually compare how 2022 compared to um, previous elections. One area that we do know that there is a change um, is that um, voter turnover, which historically is very high in PNG. You know, up to 50% of MPs have historically turned over at many elections. Obviously, the, the really low watermark was um, the 2002 elections, where only 20% of sitting MPs were returned. But in this election, I think around 65% of MPs were returned. So we saw um, uh, uh, turnout, the, the turnover wasn't as significant this time around as it has been previously. But in terms of some of those other really basic sort of statistics and things, we can't, we're not in a position to, to really reflect on that. Um, but hopefully we'll be able to get access to some of that information uh, in the coming weeks and months so that we can incorporate that into the, to the reporting. Anyway, despite the fact that elections are really competitive, large numbers of candidates, etc., um, we know that increasingly voters in Papua New Guinea are being denied genuine choice when it comes to elections. They're denied that genuine choice through block voting, coerced collective voting, violence, intimidation, pre-marked ballot papers, etc. Okay, so one of, the, one of the key ways that voting, and again, I'm gonna talk about the Highlands, that's where I observed. As I said, we had 12 ANU uh, observers this time around, and we went to, to different parts of the country and supported our teams in different parts of the country. Um, and I, I looked after our teams in the Highlands region, um, and that's where I've observed elections previously. So I'm gonna draw on that sort of, those personal reflections uh, in, this, in this presentation. So, one of the key ways that voting in the Highlands, particularly in the Upper and Central Highlands, differed from previous elections was the extent to which they were controlled. In this case, by, and I think we can go to the next slide. Here we go, yep, thank you. Um, in this case, by candidates under the watchful eye of the security personnel. At this polling stations, the citizens wanting to vote um, had no choice but to watch a small group of men fill out all of the available ballot papers while the voters were kept at bay outside the locked gate. So we can see the voters outside the gate there. We can see the candidate on the inside um, instructing um, the, the polling officials and, and I suppose his key supporters um, to fill out the ballot papers there. So we didn't see any, any people actually voting, any citizens voting at that polling station. Um, if we go to the next slide, and again, this is another polling station and another candidate, again, under the watchful eye of the security personnel who are protecting the process that's going on here. Um, in this case, the candidate was not only inside the polling station, just like in the previous set of photos. Um, he was inside the polling station claiming all the available ballots as his, but he was seen to be making payments um, to officials inside the polling station. Um, and for me, this was really striking. As I said, I've witnessed the last six elections. Um, I've observed those last six elections in Heller, Southern Highlands and Western Highlands. Um, and this was the first time ever that I've seen candidates actually within the polling station. I've seen them previously outside of the polling station, maybe in a vehicle, on the road, in the vicinity of a polling station. But I saw this over and over again in this election. The candidates themselves actually inside the polling place claiming the votes as theirs. This is my base vote. Um, sometimes we had multiple candidates, um, you know, particularly in cases where you had um, both an open and a regional candidate who happened to be from that place claiming those votes. Um, at a particular polling station. So this is the first time, and this is a really significant change to my mind. Um, and, and in some cases too, it wasn't just candidates, we saw warlords, we saw strongmen. So whether it was a candidate or whether it was somebody else acting on behalf of a candidate, polling station after polling station, that was what I saw, was um, polling stations that were being claimed 
um, as being a polling station for a particular candidate. Um, we can go to the next slide now. Okay, so this is actually a quote from one of our um, observers. And I'll just... So at Corriba Station, the people didn't vote, even for the second and third preferences. The officials shared the second and third preferences for the open seat and the one, two, three on the regional papers to candidates of their choosing. All of the first preferences were marked for William Boundo. This kind of voting was the first of its kind. They brought all the ballot boxes for all six council wards into Corriba Station and lined them up side by side. The candidate and his supporters told the officials just to sign and fill all the ballot papers. Even the security forces couldn't believe their eyes. They protested, but no one listened. The voters were outside the fence and they were forcing me to say something, but I couldn't. So, um, in the past, our previous observations have reported that voters in, in many locations across the Highlands have been issued with pre-marked ballot papers. Sometimes that was pre-marked papers where the first preference had been marked, but the voters were able to, um, as people say, exercise their democratic choice with the second and third preference. But this time around, there were a number of polling stations where, you know, all of the, you know, first, second and third um, were pre-marked and being handed out um, sometimes to voters to, to, to come through and be issued a pre-marked ballot paper that they put into the ballot box. But in many cases, just being um, filled out by groups of people who were then putting them into the box en masse. And the majority of citizens in those places were sitting around outside watching that process. So totally excluded from the process. Um, okay, sorry. Let me just have a look here. Okay, sorry, if we go back one, <laughs> you jumped ahead of me a little bit. So just here's, here's another case of, um, you know, so we had polling stations that were clearly controlled by candidates, um, strong men, warlords, whatever we want to call it. We also had polling stations that were clearly being controlled by parties. So within the polling station, people wearing, you know, party shirts um, and, and filling out ballot papers en masse and, and overseeing them being um, deposited into the ballot box. Oh, I can use that. That's even better. <laughs> Where does I point it to, though? Okay. No? Anyway, next, we can go to the next one. Okay, so again, here's just a, um, another slide showing, um, showing a polling station that's being um, controlled by, by supporters. Again, a few things that um, I think were really noticeable to me. So, you know, we heard in the commissioner's presentation today um, around the, you know, the sort of... I suppose, increased efforts to provide opportunities for women to participate in the elections, the separate lines, etc. Um, the reality was, certainly in much of the Highlands, um, we didn't see that in operation um, at all. In a few places, there were fleeting attempts early in the day, perhaps, but certainly um, very much the election was a male affair. And so... You know, if you look at lots and lots of the photos, we see that women are pretty much absent from all of these, these photos of what's going on at polling stations. Here we have a group of men filling out um, the ballot papers. The, the second picture there with the ballot box is actually a video, but I can't get it to play in the, in the thing. But they're, they're actually... The box isn't sealed and they're depositing, you know, sort of wads of ballot papers in... Um, at a time. This particular polling station, um, which is in Jiwaka, um, has over 3,000 people enrolled at that polling station, you know, and they have one day polling. It's absolutely impossible to process 3,000 voters in a single day. And so what that does is creates pressure from the community, obviously, to dispense with process, you know, so there's, there's, there's some extent to which, um, you know, citizens are endorsing this process because obviously they want their, their ballots cast. But it's still very much the case 
that a small group of people are deciding who is casting those votes and there wasn't any space for political competition. And so the open candidate who was controlling this particular polling station um, also decided where the, um, how the regional ballot papers um, were to be cast. And that actually has led to some, some ongoing fighting and things that's, that has taken place in, in that part of Jiwaka since the election. So, uh, where are we going to go? Okay, sorry. Okay. If we go to the next slide now, and again, just I suppose just following on on this 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 sort of issue of the way the election was controlled, and these are the photos that I'm showing you too are from lots of different Highlands provinces. It's not all the same place. It's not all the same province. This one, this is a polling station from Mount Hagen Central, um, and polling here and at several of the polling stations in Mount Hagen were controlled by private security. So in this case, um, a, a local ward councillor had employed what he called 20-man squads. Ah, thank you very much. Who, had, who he had issued with these high-visibility vests that on the back of the vest it said 2022 PNG NGE security. Um, and so I specifically asked about that because this was the only place in, in, in Hagen Central that I, that I witnessed this. Um, and the response was that the, this, this councillor um, had done that. What happened at this particular polling place was that the voters actually did line up, and this was one place where I did see a male and female line, I have to say that. But the voters came in. There was some attempt to identify and mark all photos, which was also um, a little bit unusual uh, in terms of what I did see across the Highlands. There was the, the local councillor was deciding who got ballot papers. So if people weren't from there, he was sending them away. But the thing was that the the people in the in the security vest were the ones holding the ballot papers and or holding the, the pens. And so you'd come through, you'd be issued with a, a ballot paper. In this case, they weren't pre-marked. They were, they were given to the voters, but then they had to go and present to one of the security guards in the vest who would fill out their ballot paper on behalf of the voter. Um, and while I was, was there, in fact, this, this old lady in the picture was quite interesting. She came back and argued with the, the presiding officer and said, I need a new ballot paper because mine was spoilt. And he said, well, where's the spoilt paper? Give it to me. And she said, no, no, it's in the box. And he said, well, how was it spoiled? And she said, well, I went over and I told the security that I wanted to vote for this person, this person and this person. But the security filled out the ballot paper for this candidate, this candidate, and this candidate, and that wasn't my choices. Um, and then the security put the ballot paper in the box. So the, the lady was very forceful, and, and in the end, after quite a standoff, the um, presiding officer issued her with a new ballot paper and let her actually mark it herself. But yes, so this polling station was very much controlled by this group of security who clearly, based on, on what we witnessed there, were marking the papers according to their own wishes and not the wishes of the, the actual voters. Um, so, just go on to the next bit. Okay. Oh, that's that, sorry. Okay. We can just, oh no, this is working now. Actually, and this is just my last slide because like, um, okay. So, just, I suppose in summary, based on what we've sort of seen thus far and what our observers have seen, um, it's, it's our view that the 2022 elections certainly didn't improve on 20, 
17. Rather, the elections, as I said at the outset, witnessed a further deterioration in the overarching electoral environment, but it also saw women and urban settlers increasingly disenfranchised. And if we think about this issue of franchise, that um, I'm sort of struck by some of the, listening to the earlier presentation and the, the, you know, some of the things that the commissioner had to say and even the, the sort of endorsement that, um, you know, Governor Bird is the chairman of the, the special parliamentary committee. Um, there does seem to be a, um, I suppose, uh, a willingness, I suppose, to entertain this notion of LLG-based voting. And I think that that's something that really needs to be thought about because even at the ward level, we're seeing that, you know, women voters, elderly, people with disability um, are disenfranchised, right? If we're creating a situation where everybody is expected to come into the, you know, LLG headquarters to vote, that's going to make it really, really difficult for... Um, you know, a large proportion of the population to feel that they can do that safely. Um, our citizen surveys are telling us, you know, from 2017, and we've crunched that data, we know that less than half of the people that we surveyed reported that they were able to vote and to vote freely, right? So more than half of people surveyed talked about experiencing either not being able to vote at all or experiencing intimidation, violence, etc when voting. Having a look at the data thus far, um, I think it's going to be even fewer people this time around are reporting that they were able to vote freely. We know too that from our previous election work, those experiences and the way that people participate in the election are very much gendered. So, um, for instance, you know, elections are gendered in relation to money politics, so men are, you know, report receiving money in relation for their, for their vote far more often than women do. And when they do receive money, they report receiving larger amounts of money than women do. Equally, um, if we look within individual electorates, you know, where we're doing these citizen surveys, we know that men are more likely to have been able to, to vote and to vote freely. Um, women are far more likely to report having experienced intimidation. Now, the extent to which that happens varies considerably across the country, right? And, um, you know, it is better in some places than others, but even in those places, this is what our data has shown us in the past, even in those places where we think that elections are better than in other places, you know, and often people talk about elections in the New Guinea Islands, say, being better than elections elsewhere. We still had, last time around, over 25% of women reporting that they either didn't vote or weren't able to vote freely in the New Guinea Islands, you know. Um, but when we went to other parts of the country, so um, in our electorates in Hela and in, in Enga in 2017, only 4% of women surveyed reported that they were able to vote and able to vote freely, right? So we've got these massive differences across the country. In terms of our data for this time, and we haven't crunched at all, but um, before I came away, one of my colleagues who's working on cleaning the data and looking at it um, came and said to me, hey, I've had a look at the data from Hella and, and looked at the post-polling surveys. Right? And of every single person we inter interviewed in Hella in the election, only two people surveyed reported voting at all. Right? And he said, this can't be true. And I said, well, no, actually, that's consistent with what I saw on polling day because we saw the pictures where the polling was very much controlled and citizens were locked out of the process. But here we have a case where our, you know, the, the quantitative data that we're collecting is totally consistent with the qualitative data, the observations that, that we made. And so we'll be able to, to, to look at different parts of the country and the extent to, to which that's happened in various places. But this is where I say I, I'm fully expecting that we will, across the country, um, see the proportion of voters reporting that they were able to vote freely um, will diminish. And I think that moving away from ward-based voting 
to centralised LLG voting will actually just um, disenfranchise particular citizens um, more, than, more than others as well. And so that's something that obviously needs to be given serious consideration as the electoral process is reviewed, you know. How committed is PNG to uh, ensuring the franchise of all citizens? Um, okay, in terms of um, just, again, overall, I think, you know, our observations have shown that the democratic processes were hijacked in many, many places around the country, resulting in elections that were neither free, safe, fair nor inclusive. The elections were marred by widespread fraud and malpractice, which was more brazen and more purposeful than in 2007, 2012 or in 2017. This included extensive vote rigging, coerced collective voting and the hijacking and or destruction of ballot boxes. Political gifting and money politics were more widespread and again qualitatively different to previous elections, although continuing a trend or continuing some of the things we started to see in 2017. So I think when LPV first came in and we saw uh, certainly an increase in money politics at that point, but it was money politics that was... Money was being used to try and... Um, you know, sort of influenced the voters themselves. So a lot of voters reported receiving, you know, uh, you know, smallish amounts of money for their first, second and third preferences. Certainly in 2017 and increasingly in this election, what we've seen is where money is being used in elections, it's being concentrated in the hands of fewer and fewer people and it's being concentrated in the hands of people who can deliver results, right? Whether that is... Um, a polling official, an electoral official, um, a local leader, um, a local strongman, etc. So the money is being concentrated in, 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 in the hands of a few people rather than being spread out to the, the community more broadly. And this, in fact, is, is something that we really started to see in those last couple of elections that were run under First Past the Post. Right? So we're actually seeing some of the shifts that happened when LPV was introduced. Now, you know, some of the, the, the practices that we're seeing are actually more, more closely related to some of the things that we saw under, under First Past the Post, which I think is sort of quite interesting as well. Um, so, just let me see. Okay, I think as well, and, and again, I'm sure everybody's seen all sorts of things on, on social media, um, and we've seen the, the reports on, um, you know, I suppose officially people are saying that there's fewer deaths in this election than, than there was previously, and certainly the figure that is often cited in relation to 2017 is the figure from a news report um, last time where we recorded and documented 204 deaths in the context of the election. Um, the, I think sort of officially people are talking around 50 deaths at the moment. Um, again, once we've finally crunched all our numbers, it will be much, much higher than that. Um, our observers witnessed people um, being killed at polling stations and, and all manner of things. And in a lot of parts, in a lot of places... Um, uh, LLG's electorates went dark once the papers went out, like, so the mobile network was turned off and different things. So it was only when our observers came back and we're getting reports. And a lot of those things too have, have sort of shown up on, on social media as well. But we'll, we'll know more um, uh, shortly. I think, um, again, um, Despite the sort of quietness of the election, we did see, you know, sort of really desperate acts by desperate people to gain power, you know. So we saw special purpose declarations again, um, you, know, uh, you know, particularly in the Southern Highlands, that resulting in, in um, you know, sort of flow-on violence 
um, again. And violence that, that, you know, could be entirely anticipated based on um, what had happened in, in 2017. So obviously, as other speakers have, have said today in the, in the presentations, there is so much that needs to be done to, to restore confidence in the electoral process. Um, and, and if that confidence is to be restored, it actually does require some really um, definitive and some you know, quite bold action and people being willing to... to um, I think, embrace some really significant sort of changes. Interestingly, and I won't go into it now, but I think what we do see at the local level is that there are often attempts to um, inject confidence into the process, you know, whether that be through um, candidates signing ballot boxes before they go out so they can be sure it's the same ballot boxes coming back, um, you know, so... so Local processes that are not covered by the law and that are outside of the, the process are being adopted in places um, by communities who are trying to both ensure their own safety post-election but equally to put some confidence back in the process. And I think if, if we are talking about, you know, some really widespread reflection on the election and potential electoral reform then there might also be opportunity to think about and to discuss whether or not some of these local attempts to inject confidence in the system can actually be um, adapted or adopted in a more widespread sort of way. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Haley. Uh, to our Zoom participants online and our audience in the room, there will be time for questions uh, and comments after the presentations. 